Welcome. My name is Fran Kaufman and I'm very excited to share with you today information about hybrid closed loop and in particular the Minimed 670G system. So let's start with why do we need the automation of insulin delivery? So this is data from the U.S. from our type 1 exchange from 2013. 26,000 patients at 67 sites across the U.S. and showing by age their A1C. And I think we can all appreciate that we have not yet achieved the kind of outcomes across the age spectrum for people with type 1 diabetes that we would like to have. And on the right side of this slide also shows that we still have an excess of diabetic ketoacidosis as well as of severe hypoglycemia. So we need to continue to do more. This slide shows the evidence build for our incremental advancement to hybrid closed loop. So first we started with a platform of the sensor augmented pump and did a number of clinical trials to show the advantage of both a sensor and a pump together. Then we went on to automate insulin delivery. The first thing we did was to suspend on low, which means that the clinician, the patient together decide a low threshold and then when that is reached with the sensor glucose data, there is a suspend of insulin delivery. We did a number of clinical trials that show the 35% less exposure to low SGs in a stable A1C with low glucose suspend. The next was our smart guard suspend before low technology. Essentially, why wait till you get to that low threshold? Why not stop insulin delivery in anticipation of reaching it within 30 minutes? A number of studies, again, that show about a 75% less lows as a result of a predictive low glucose suspend algorithm, and again, with no increase in high glucose values. But that's about suspending insulin. What we really want to do is now, can we actually deliver insulin off the sensor glucose data through an algorithm? And that's where we are today with our uh, Minimed 670G system, our SmartGuard Automode technology that allows us through a number of clinical trials again show that we have lowered the A1C, improved overall glucose control, and decreased glucose variability. So of course at the center is our Minimed 670G insulin pump, so it's got our SmartGuard, our Automode algorithm. That algorithm accepts the data from the Guardian Sensor 3 and then every five minutes goes through uh, the calculations to determine how much basal insulin needs to be delivered. That sensor needs to be calibrated. It's done with our Contour NextLink 2.4 blood glucose meter. We have CareLink software that shows you the data that is retained within the pump so that you can look at insulin delivery as well as glucose values. What we've been able to show with our Guardian Sensor 3 is that it has a MARD mean absolute relative difference between the sensor glucose data and a YSI, a Yellow Springs instrument, uh, in adults of 8.7 when there's three to four calibrations a day, and pediatrics 8.79 with three to four calibrations a day. So the sensor then is, the sensor data is transmitted to the pump, it runs through the algorithm, and basal insulin is dynamically delivered to the patient. So when you first put the patient on the Minimed 670G system, they are in manual mode or traditional pump technology. And what this means is you set all the pump settings that you would normally do for pump. And at this point, you can also set either suspend on low, suspend before low, and they must be in this first so that the pump can gather data on insulin delivery to the patient. So usually patients are in this traditional manual mode for about uh, five to six days or so, and then you press a button and they're ready to go into auto mode or the hybrid closed loop uh, uh, technology. So with this now, the basal rates that you have set in the pump are gone. And now through the algorithm, basal delivery occurs every five minutes. The patient boluses for their meals and for their corrections of high glucose values. This is more explanation of how 
auto mode works. First, the patient must have a minimum of eight units as their total daily dose and a maximum of 250 units of their total daily dose of insulin. Again, you must be in manual mode first between 48 hours, usually around six days, during which time the patient can be on suspend before low. Then you hit a button and it's time to go into auto mode, during which time there's the auto basal delivery of insulin targeting either 120 milligrams per deciliter, which equals 6.7 millimoles per liter. The algorithm is determining every five minutes how much insulin to, to give, dependent on the sensor glucose data at that time, where it's been, where it's projected to be, how much insulin is on board. It's really important for the algorithm to understand how much insulin is on board, and it's also important to realize that there's a maximal amount of insulin it can deliver with any one stroke that's determined by the algorithm itself and adapted every day with data from a six-day period beforehand. There's a minimum amount of insulin delivery, which is zero. There's a condition called safe basal. When the algorithm doesn't feel it can continue to deliver, it will put somebody in safe basal for a period of time. And then also what's very important is looking at the insulin sensitivity factor, which the algorithm determines itself. Very important for you to understand that there's a temporary target that the patient can use. It's 150 milligrams per deciliter or 8.3 millimole per liter. And this is usually set for exercise or illness when the patient wants to have an extra buffer against low glucose values. Now, you still set the insulin to carbohydrate ratio with the patient. Um, the correction bolus, it targets to 150 milligrams per deciliter or 8.3 millimole. And what will happen when the glucose is above that, if there's a blood glucose value entered, it will calculate what that correction should be and the patient agrees to take it. And again, it's usually using its own sensitivity factor that's been determined by the algorithm. So you set with the patient the carbohydrate ratio and the active insulin time. All the other parameters are determined by the algorithm itself. So let's talk about the pivotal trial, how we got acceptance for this device in the United States, and of course that data has been shown around the world to other regulatory bodies in addition. So we had a very significant relationship with our Federal Drug Administration in the United States, showing them years worth of data, feasibility data using the algorithm. And then once we got to the final product, we were able to um, have a trial, a single arm, non-randomized study, first in 14 to 75 year olds, then in seven to 13 year olds, and I will tell you we are almost done with the trial two to six year olds. So the inclusion criteria are here, typical criteria for a type one population across the age range. Um, for the uh, adolescents and adults, the mean A1C at entrance was 7.4. For the seven to 13 year olds, it was 7.9. And there was first a run-in phase that lasted two weeks during which time the patients were on just sensor and pump alone. Then there was a hotel study period some of them went in there right away, others went in in the second or the third month. And during that hotel study, we were able to do some challenges as well as to do a 24-hour uh, evaluation of the sensor glucose data against the reference value of the iStat machine. Then everybody was home for three months. Um, they uh, then, at the end of the study period, came in and had a study closure and an A1C, as well as the evaluation of what the glucose data was during the three-month study period. This slide shows the important study data from the adolescent and adult trial, 124 patients, mean age 37.8 years. And the top graph shows the A1C distribution. In the black is the baseline study, and then this remarkable shift to the left at the end of the study phase, so that the mean A1C in run-in was 7.4, and its study end was 6.9. This is when the patients were 87% of the time in our auto mode. During the study period, 12,000 days of patient exposure to the device, no diabetic ketoacidosis, no severe hypoglycemia, really no device-related adverse events. The 
graph at the bottom shows the sensor glucose distribution, the interquartile range from midnight to midnight, in the pink during the study phase, in the gray during the run-in phase, and from midnight to midnight. So I think you can appreciate that for all patients, adults and adolescents, we see a little bit higher glucose value at midnight than when the device is doing most of the work itself while the patient is sleeping, not eating hopefully, not having physical activity. The device brings the glucose value gradually down to the optimal range and actually uh, narrows glycemic variability. Then we see somebody wakes up, we see in the adults the peak of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In the adolescents, we see the peak of breakfast, lunch, and pretty much I don't stop eating until I go to bed. But I think what you can also appreciate is that this device mitigates both high and low glucose values, narrows glucose excursion, and that particularly for the adolescents has a big impact on highs and for the adults an impact on lows. This is the same kind of report for the pediatric pivotal trial, our patients 7 to 13 years of age, 105 of them with a mean age of 10.8 and a duration of diabetes 5.6 years. For them, the total study phase was about 10,000 patient days, and they were in auto mode 79% of the time. At the baseline, the A1C was 7.5, and at the end of the study had decreased to 7.5. And you can now see that at run-in, 36% of the patients were 7.5 or under, and at study end, 51% were. So again, no diabetic ketoacidosis, no severe hypoglycemia during the 10,000 days of patient exposure. So this slide shows a glycemic control by age in a tabular form. So beginning with less than 50 milligrams per deciliter, or 2.7 millimole per liter, less than 70 milligram per deciliter, or 3.8 millimole per liter, 71 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, or 3.9 to 10 millimole per liter, greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter, or 10 millimole per liter, and a greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter, or 16.6 millimole per liter and then comparing run-in to study phase for the adults, the 18 to 21 year olds, 14 to 17, and seven to 13. For all of them, essentially a reduction in low glucose, an increase in the time and range overall from 68% to 73%, for the adults, 65 to 70, for the uh, young adults, 57 to 65, for the teenagers, and 56 to 65 for the children. And as a result, we can see a decrease across the board in values greater than 180 and greater than 300 as well. And if we look at the same kind of data now, looking at nighttime, where again, the algorithm is doing most of the work, the patient is not having the disturbances to glucose control of eating or physical activity. And we can see that um, there is now an even greater increase in the time and range. The adults up to 83% of the time. The young adults, 73. The adolescents, 82% of the time. And the children, 81% of the time. For this time period of three to six in the morning, where we really see what the algorithm is capable of doing itself. As a result of that, a reduction in high and low glucose values. While patients are sleeping, and while the algorithm is doing all the work itself. And so now I would just wanna outline for you all the glycemic control that can result from using Minimed 670G system. We can see all the patients, the adults, the adolescents, and the children all lined up now from midnight to midnight showing that effect that the device has while people are sleeping, brings them gradually down to a great fasting glucose value and the effects of the meals and the improvement in mitigating both high and low glucose values. And not much difference really across the age ranges. So how is this really done? And this slide really articulates how this device is reducing variability of glucose values and increasing variability of insulin delivery. So for the 14 to 75 year olds and the seven to 13 year olds, we are now looking at the nighttime and showing in that orange that the range of the sensor glucose value narrows. Less glycemic variability at night, 
while the range for insulin dosing increases, regardless of the age range. And if we look at it in pie charts, essentially what we're looking at is the insulin delivery at night for the 14 to 75 year olds. A third of the time, they are on maximal insulin delivery. Of course, this is mainly at the beginning of the night when they're going to bed with a higher glucose value. And for 19% of the time, zero insulin delivery scattered throughout the night. And the other 50% of the time, anywhere from 1% to 99% of the maximum amount of insulin that can be delivered. For the children, a little bit higher time and maximal insulin delivery because their glucose values are higher. And how does this translate? So here's just a number of data points that we can pick from patients and show that the in the blue, in the closed loop time period, for the most part, the nighttime is flat, narrowing of glycemic variability. There is then during the day some variability around ingestion of meals, which you can help affect by increasing, if need be, decreasing the strength of the carbohydrate to insulin ratio. So a lot of uh, data that you can see on this, and you can particularly see the value at night of the system and how if there's a change in glycemic excursion from meal, how you can then help improve that by changing carbohydrate to insulin ratios. So that was data on what we found in our pivotal trials, but now what we have is the ability to show you the data in the real world in patients who have are using this system after our commercial launch in the United States. So this is data from the first over 3,000 patients that used the device for greater than three months. This has been published, and I think you can appreciate that compared to the pivotal trial, the data at the end of the three months was essentially mirroring what we saw in the pivotal trial. What's the difference? These are people who decided to use the system with providers from across our country versus the pivotal trial, which was at just a few sites where they got to pick the patient. So a mirroring in the real world experience of what we saw in the pivotal trial. And here's even more data. So this is the first 14,000 patients that we had data on broken up by age range. And if I compare up to the same age ranges, again, this would mirror the pivotal trial results. So an improvement in the time and range, a decrease in both high and low glucose values, an improvement in the mean, and a decreasing in the standard deviation as a measure of glycemic variability. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate your participation.